we're just old guys, Randy. So. Yeah, tell me about it. All right, shoulder instability. So, uh, or shoulder arthroplasty, rather. Um, so this is kind of a fun talk just to go through some of these concepts because uh, I think there's a lot more patients that we're gonna all be seeing for, uh, with, for shoulder arthroplasty. And uh, I made the comment in the last talk and kind of throughout the weekend about there's a lot of things that can lead to somebody having a prematurely arthritic shoulder. And one of them is instability. And this is called dislocation arthropathy. And Dr. Mattson kind of coined that term as well as capsulorophy arthropathy. And I alluded to it at the end of the last talk, saying that if you have an instability procedure where you're left with a tight anterior capsule, and you go into extra rotation, you're going to have a lot of obligate posterior translation. Your humeral head is going to shift posteriorly and essentially go out the back. And so this instability or dislocation arthropathy is a big reason that I see so many patients in the clinic uh, that are very young, you know, 60 year old, 50 year old, even 40 year old that say, yeah, when I was 16, I had a shoulder, I dislocated three times and then I had this procedure and it's been bad ever since and here they are in the clinic with a shoulder replacement. So uh, we know that there's an increased incidence of arthritis in patients following stabilization procedures as little as 12% and is reportedly high in some case series at 62%. Uh, incidence is higher with posterior instability than with anterior instability reported in many studies. And it's also higher in older patients following a dislocation. So if, you, if you're elder, meaning like my age, 56, and I dislocate my shoulder, very likely that I'm gonna have a lot of OA because of, again, advancing years and the fact that the shoulder's probably, probably not in great shape when I dislocate at an older age to begin with. This is from uh, 70 patients that Dr. Bailey and I have worked on. And as I mentioned, I might have alluded to earlier that he sends very intelligently, I think, um, he sends all his patients in for a preoperative evaluation to look at range of motion and strength. And so this is 70 patients. Here's the mean age of those patients that were getting, going in. They usually get seen anywhere from two to four weeks before they have their shoulder uh, replacement. 46.1 years of age, that's humbling. Um, so the pre-op evaluation, the range of motion, they have about 105 degrees of flexion and about 95 degrees of abduction. So that's pretty bad. I mean, you're talking about a 46 year old person on mean um, and that's all they have. Extra rotation, 45 and 18 degrees at 90. So I point that out because one of the early signs I find of an osteoarthritic shoulder without looking at the x-ray is to have focal internal rotation loss. You can see none of those are good, but if you see somebody with a cuff tear, if you see somebody with a labral tear, they don't usually have 18 degrees of internal rotation. And so that telltale sign when somebody's got early osteoarthritis, I wouldn't bet the farm on it, but I'd be suspicious when you got that little amount of interrotation and their history kind of is pointing towards a degenerative shoulder. If they're coming to you first time and they haven't seen a doctor or something, that's a good patient to get an x-ray on because you're probably gonna find some flattening of the humeral head, some glenoid erosion or something that's gonna cause that limitation uh, in range of motion. Strength deficits, you can see massive, about 30%, 30 to 40% decreases. ERI ratio is terrible, only about half instead of a 66. And their SST, that simple simple shoulder, that's out of 12 questions, they only answer yes to four of them. And they're usually like the really simple ones. So SAD, single assessment, numeric evaluation, they feel their shoulder is 34 out of 100. So these are people that, you know, they're, they're sore, they're painful, they're at a big risk of, of having their lifestyle ruined, you know, their life ruined by a, a sore shoulder. Severe chondrolysis, we talked about this earlier today before, um, you know, some of you came in, um, but, Having a, a pain pump, having a prior surgery with a bioabsorbable anchor, there's a number of different factors that make somebody at risk for chondrolysis. And that's what's, that just is a severe dissolution of articular cartilage as a result of lysis or dissolution of the cartilage matrix. And uh, there's a number of different thermal probes, bupivacaine pain pumps, all those are risk factors. Believe it or not, this is a 17 year old high school softball player that had uh, glenohumeral chondrolysis. She had had a slap repair two years earlier. That's her humeral head at 17. You can see massive wear of her cartilage. And you can just imagine how painful that was. And so she had a shoulder placement at age 17. Terrible. This is, I mentioned earlier, a goat's beard deformity. When you first start to see early osteoarthritis, you see a very small spur and some flattening of the humeral head, but maintenance of joint space. 
joint space gradually gets narrow until it's just completely gone, and you see this projection that they call a goat's beard deformity. That's one of the things you'll see on the humeral side. This is humeral osteoarthritis. You can see the massive amount of flattening of the head, almost looks like a muffin. And this is a Friar Tuck wear pattern. You know, remember Friar Tuck from Robin Hood? He had that characteristic pattern. That's a central wear pattern on a humeral head. It occurs, uh, this is a, a severe osteoarthritic uh, arthritis in a 28-year-old shoulder. You can see how bad that gets chewed up from many different factors. It occurs on the glenoid side as well. So you can have erosion at the glenoid. There's many different glenoid types that you'll see. And the ideal surgical implant plant, again, if we talk about anatomic TSAs, and we are right now, not the reverse, with an anatomic, you want it to restore the anatomy almost as perfectly as possible. You want to have the same offset or distance from the rotator cuff insertions to the glenoid so that you don't either have it too short or overstuff the joint where then all of a sudden the implant's too big and they have loss of range of motion. So it has to really replicate the anatomy as much as possible. A little bit on the history, in 1893 it was the first one done. It was made out of rubber and platinum. And uh, as you can see, as the years progressed, it was used for more and more things. Initially just for RA, it was only a humeral implant. Then they became a glenoid implant in 74 with Near, Charles Near, you probably heard about Charles Near, famous shoulder surgeon in uh, New York. And it became an indication for OA, which it currently is used to a great extent now. Sometimes just like in the hip, they'll only have a surface replacement where they just put a cap on it. Um, this is the Copeland, which I have quite a bit of experience with in our clinic because of Dr. Bailey. Um, he sent me a lot of patients through the years in our clinic uh, for this Copeland resurfacing. It's a very successful one to be used in young active people because you don't really move, remove much bone stock and it's very revisable. Um, and so this is kind of what it looks like. It's just like a little cap that goes on the end of the humeral head. They also have uh, these screw-in areas when there's very focal lesions in a humeral head. They can actually screw that in place as you see there without having to actually replace the entire head of the humeral. The exposure is what we really need to know about. And if we had to end the talk literally in three minutes, which we don't, but if we had to, this is what I would want your take home message to be that when you have an anterior approach, which is most common in America, to shoulder replacement, they use a deltopectoral incision. And with a deltopectoral incision, they actually cut through the subscapularis. And you have two ways of doing that. You can literally cut mid-tendon, where it's a tendon-to-tendon -tendon repair then at the end of the procedure. They cut the subscapularis tendon, and they sew it back together at the end of the procedure. What's done usually to a lesser extent, but in some regional parts of the country it's done more extensively, is you can also do a lesser tuberosity osteotomy. Remember, the subscapularis is unique. It inserts on what? The great, not the greater tuberosity like all the other cuff tendons, the lesser tuberosity. So what they'll do is they'll actually excise the lesser tuberosity, take the bone off and turn it off to this side with the entire subscap intact. And then they'll screw down or suture down the lesser tuberosity after the procedure is done in its location. So something has to be done to the subscap to get it out of the way so the implant can go in. So they either cut it mid substance, which is what I have the most experience with because most of the doctors that refer me patients all do the, 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 uh, the primary tendon repair of the subscap. And then the other one, which I have seen some of, that's the other type of surgical approach where they do a lesser tuberosity osteotomy. In either case, something has happened to the subscapularis. So you'll see in the subsequent slides that we limit extra rotation stretching early on and intra rotation resistance. And so that's just to protect that structure, which is very important. So there's your exposure. They use a sizer so they know exactly what size to put in. They ream a little central peg. They use a little thing that looks like a really cool cheese grater, but it's really not. It just basically shapes the humeral head since it's been flattened. They want it to be very round so that they can put the proper, uh, proper size head on. So here it is. They remove all the debris, make room for the implant. They try one of the plastic heads that's exactly the same shape as the metallic. And then they snap the metallic head into place and that's what it looks like on x-ray. So that's just a surface replacement, the example of a surface replacement. If a normal TSA is done, meaning a stemmed TSA, this is the amount of the head that's removed. 
So that's why they can maintain not the, the, uh, uh, the uh, insertion of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor because the tuberosity stays in place. They cut it above or superior to where they insert. So there isn't any harm done to those particular structures. Again, the subscap is harmed here just to get the implant in, but it's usually a primary tendon repair. And then they're actually able to put the stem into the, uh, the humerus, the canal of the humerus, and then they snap the head on. They try to use the same width of the, of the humeral head as what they took out. So they maintain that offset, maintain the bony anatomy uh, in the shoulder. So the surgical rehab is very similar. You say, I've seen this slide a couple times. Yep, exactly. You want to know the status of the rotator cuff because that so goes the rotator cuff, so goes the function. These are not usually done on people who don't have very good rotator cuff function. If the, if the rotator cuff function is bad, they're usually getting a reverse. They don't risk it with this type now. But, so you want to know if there's anything else done other than to the subscap, because the subscap is a given. You also want to know what kind of glenoid is replaced. Is there a new glenoid in there? Is there an existing glenoid? That makes a difference. And their degree of postoperative mobilization, again, which is key. How long have they been immobilized? How tight are they? Are they already frozen? That's going to change the way we do it. So development of a postoperative protocol. Basically, we used sort of like some, some trucks uh, or SUVs are built on a truck model. It's basically just a truck that turns into an SUV. We think of this as our protocol. We have a rotator cuff protocol that we turned into an arthroplasty protocol. It's basically exactly the same in many respects, but it's been customized to the arthroplasty procedure. At the end of the day, it's a tissue issue. It's all about balancing these tissues. Yes, there's an implant in there, but it's all about making sure your capsular tensions are restored. It's all about making sure your rotator cuff is re-strengthened and balanced because that's what's gonna give you normal uh, function. So weeks one through six, same kind of thing, passive range of motion, progressing to active assistive range of motion. There's typically no limitations in flexion, abduction, or internal rotation. Uh, manual scapular stabilization, submaximal external rotation strength. And you say, what? Yeah, you can actually go in because nothing is usually harmed on the external rotator. It's just the anterior. So what's the key difference? Right here, this is the most important slide in the entire talk right here. So limit extra rotation, range of motion, no ER typically between 30 to 45 degrees, and no internal rotation resistive exercise. So all that's done to protect your subscapularis. So evolution, Dr. Bailey used to say no extra rotation beyond neutral. And we found that we needed more extra rotation in young active patients, they just weren't getting it back. So then he started saying, okay, let's start going 30 to 45 degrees in the first six weeks and then see how much extra rotation we got. And that led to a very, very good and appreciable increase in extra rotation range of motion and outcomes. So the evolution of the protocol was such that we had to basically push extra rotation a little bit earlier, carefully, um, and that led to some, some better outcomes. If you look in the literature, there's all different types of limitations. Some limit no extra rotation in the first postoperative period. Some say 30, for 30 to 40 degrees. All of these uh, new, ER to neutral for six weeks in Christian Gerber's study. So these are all famous shoulder surgeries and their basic extra rotation limitations um, in their protocols. Bicep status. There's almost always, always a bicep tenodesis. Uh, could be a tenotomy, but usually it's a tenodesis they always get rid of the bicep because they don't want the bicep to hang up on the implant. One less thing to go wrong. They don't want to go back in on these shoulders because of the, pro the problem with uh, infection and other things. They don't want to have to go back in and, and re-salvage the case, so to speak, because of re recalcitrant bicep pain. So they just get rid of the bicep at the time of surgery. So this means there's no resisted elbow flexion in the first six weeks. So not, no resisted elbow flexion for six weeks. What are some other things that are done? Um, many times in really young individual, okay, let's, go, let's back up a second, sorry. Um, what's the limiting factor as far as uh, longevity with the shoulder replacement? The glenoid side or the humeral side? Any ideas? Humeral side, I mean glenoid side. So humerus will last 30 or more years. It's great. It's made out of solid metal. Randy could drive his big F-250 over the top of it, wouldn't even phase it. Glenoid side, 
10 to 15 years is kind of expected. So if you're 50 and you have a TSA, you could actually have the humerus for maybe till you're 80, 30 years. The problem is at 65, you're probably gonna need another glenoid. The glenoids just don't last, both the fixation and the material. So in some really young people, they will replace the, the uh, they'll replace the humeral side and they'll put in basically what's called interpositional arthroplasty. And interpositional arthroplasty really is, is nothing more than using some, sub, some surface to resurface the joint. So it could be IT band. In this case, it's dermal allograft, same stuff that they use for the superior capsule reconstruction. So Wright Medical makes the thing on the left-hand side, that's called the graft jacket. It comes in a sheet, just like construction paper when you're in kindergarten and you're able to just cut little shapes out of your uh, uh, construction paper. Same thing here, they trace the glenoid and then they suture it in place as you see on the right-hand side. So when you know this has been done, again, if you have the ability to see the, the, uh, the operative report, you wanna make sure that you're not doing any translational type mobilizations because the last thing you want is that humeral head bumping and shearing across the, uh, the glenoid with all the knots, the fixation, and the chances of, of causing harm to that device. Obviously, it's very strong, but you want everything to heal. So in the early post-operative phase, you would do much less translational mobilization than traditional stretching with this type of patient. So early on, we can't really stress the anterior capsule because it's healing. So we have to be careful with exhortation, but we don't have to be careful with interrotation. And you don't want posterior capsular tightness to develop because that leads to anterior shearing. So you really want to work on the posterior capsule early on. Make sure you're not limited in that motion because there's no limitations there from the doctor or the surgical procedure that say that you can't. So as far as uh, post-op two weeks to four weeks, that's when we start doing things like pulleys in addition to the range of motion and manual therapy that we're doing. And we're really doing a lot of rotator cuff and scapular stabilization. The one thing we're not doing yet is interrotation strengthening because we're kind of to protect the uh, subscapularis. So some of the same things. Some of these patients are moderately unstable. We use some configurations of taping as uh, proprioceptive cueing and kinesthetic awareness, things like that, very successfully. We do that in all our patients, but this is just one example of this particular patient. And then starting at six weeks, we start doing interrotation in addition to all the other exercises we've already been doing because we can do that. We also can then push for ex, uh, extra rotation range of motion to end ranges. And the key is getting good external to inter rotation muscle balance. And the reason for that is, if you look at this, you wanna have a balanced net force. You don't wanna have a lot of inter rotation strength and hardly any external, because then when you, when you co-contract the shoulder, you'll have a shearing of the, of the shoulder in an anterior direction from the anterior pull, or vice versa. If you have all posterior cuff strength, but no anterior strength, you can control contract the shoulder, the head will shear posteriorly. Why don't we want that? Because of the rocking horse phenomenon. Rocking horse phenomenon is just a fancy way of saying when you have two keels or a central keel, those little pegs that go into the glenoid, um, oftentimes if you have that shearing back and forth, it'll cause that to rock back and forth and can actually cr create this impact, implant loosening. And that's one of the biggest side effects of this particular procedure or problems with this procedure is on the glenoid side. Glenoid complications are number one, our number one concern. So uh, we talked about the force couples before. This is just shoulder extension, doing it standing. Sometimes people don't want to get prone. This is an example of an older guy that came in and we actually didn't do many prone exercises with him, so we did a lot more uh, in standing. Here's your force couple. We talked about Dr. Kibler's um, uh, force couples uh, uh, or scapular exercises. This is, uh, again, some of the closed chain exercises or things to do to help with elevation similar to the rotator cuff. So some of these slides are the same as the rotator cuff talk. So I'm gonna kind of skip through these and whatnot. Um, what about return to sports? What do the shoulder and elbow society say? Well, there's certain ones they don't recommend. Things like rock climbing, things like shooting coyotes. Oh, sorry, Randy, just kidding. Said, but uh, shoot, you know, shooting is something that's allowed with experience, you know, firing a gun, having that sh jolt the shoulder back. That's allowed with experience. And then there's some things that they recommend, things like biking, swimming, cross-country skiing, jogging, those types of activities. So the return to sport is actually recognized and, and, and sort of supported in this population. This is Dr. McCarty's fine work showing that a very high percentage of people go back to things like fishing, swimming, downhill skiing, cross-country skiing, golf, tennis, racquetball, weightlifting, softball, um, that this is possible. 
to skip over this stuff. It's just some uh, some outcome things on that and. Um, interpositional arthroplasty. You can actually use meniscal tissue as well. So this was one case that we did. A, I didn't do it. I did the rehab, but Dr. Bailey did the great surgery um, where they use meniscal allograft. So they actually used, instead of human uh, dermis, they actually used a meniscal allograft. So they took a human meniscus uh, and put it in a horseshoe shape around the joint. And that made, this was a 28 year old labor, had 16 prior surgeries. Uh, in his shoulder and essentially was referred to Dr. Bailey for fusion of his shoulder. And he said, well, why don't we try um, a, a humor replacement? And then because of his young age, he wanted to use a meniscus. And the kid did really well. It was actually a really good case. So, um, but anyway, that's all I got. That's uh, arthroplasty. So any questions? I know I breezed through just a couple of those last slides, but uh, I want to leave a couple minutes for questions and stuff that you guys might have before Randy and I run to the uh, airport. You got anything? How's that softball break? Should you go back to playing? at this she she didn't go back to playing she kind of was very timid about going back to play softball and everything but um, there's a woman that you saw a lot of pictures of Susie the one in all the videos and stuff that's really pretty lax um, anyway I saw her I wish I could show you the picture I saw my phone but I did a course last weekend in Mesa and she always helps me with labs and local courses and stuff like that she's got two kids and a third one on the way She's like literally due in one week. She might have given birth like this weekend or whatever, but she was at this course as my lab instructor with the biggest stomach. She's just this little thing. She got the biggest stomach you've ever seen in her life. Well, anyway, she's all excited. She came over. She said, you're not going to believe this, but I just saw the patient. Her name's Jessica. No big deal. You won't know who she is, so no HIPAA violation. So I just called, saw Jessica, and I said, what do you mean, Jessica? You know Jessica, the one that was 17 when she had the shoulder replacement. I said, oh, yeah, how's she doing? She said, she's 35 years old. She's got three kids. She lives three houses down from me. I feel really old. So anyway, the kids, you know, because we worried about, because she was on, this kid was on, before we saw her, she was on pain medication, like, for two years, you know, because she had just retractable shoulder pain and needed this replacement and all this stuff. And uh, we were really concerned because when you see a kid like that, um, not only did we want to restore her function in her shoulder, but we worried about just her overall life, you know, and, and, and psychology and everything like that. And she's evidently, shoulder's good, she plays with her kids, she's not involved in any sports, but she's still very fit looking and, and healthy and all that kind of stuff. And um, again, it's been, you know, what if we do the math, 17 to 35, it's been, you know, 15, 15 so or so, so years since she's had this procedure, almost 20 years since she had this procedure, and she's still doing like really good. So.